Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome to another episode in this Skew T and Hodograph series. In the last video, we began our discussion of hodographs after moving on from the Skew T. And we constructed an actual hodograph from a set of raw data. And today we're going to take a look at how we can estimate some different quantities and um, some certain vectors by looking at the hodograph. We did this a while back in this series for the skew t. We calculated a bunch of different parameters directly from the diagram, and we're going to do the same thing today. So let's jump right in. Um, to start here, this is the complete hodograph that we began to construct in the last video. So we only drew a couple of different wind vectors here, a couple of different points, just to get you the gist of how a hodograph is constructed. But this is the actual complete hodograph that is associated with that raw data. So a couple of points just of review before we start. If you recall, we talked about what a vector is last time. Basically, it's a representation of a quantity that has a magnitude and a direction. So, for example, wind is a vector quantity. It has a magnitude and direction. So say we had a wind that is from the south at 30 knots. We would draw something like this, and that's our wind vector. And of course, the wind is described by the direction that it's coming from, not the direction it's blowing towards. So if the wind is blowing from the south, we would call that a southerly wind. So just a couple points of refreshing your memory there before we start looking at these different quantities we can find from the hodograph. And the first one we're going to talk about is something that you've already seen before in the previous video, and that is the ground relative wind vector. And the ground relative wind vector is basically the wind that, as it is at whatever level you're interested in. So if we wanted to draw the one kilometer ground relative wind vector, we would simply just draw that vector that we drew in the previous video. We would just draw it from the origin going up to the point that we're interested interested in, in this case, one kilometer. So if we wanted to draw the six kilometer um, wind, and before we continue, these numbers here and these points are heights above ground level um, at intervals of one kilometer. So it makes it a little bit easier to follow along. This is the surface here, one kilometer, two kilometer, three, etc. So if we wanted to draw the ground relative wind vector at, say, six kilometers, we would draw that vector from the origin up to six kilometers. And that's all it is. Pretty simple and something you've already seen in the previous video. So now let's talk about something called the wind shear vector or the shear vector. Um, as you may know, the wind shear is, it describes the change in wind speed and direction with height. And the way we draw that on the hodograph is we have two different lev levels that make up a, a certain layer that we're inter interested in. And all we do is we draw a vector from the bottom of that layer to the top of that layer as it appears on the hodograph. So say we wanted to find the zero to two kilometer shear vector. All we would do is draw a vector starting at that lowest level within that layer, which is zero kilometers, and we would draw a vector up to the top of that level as it appears on the hodograph. So that would be our zero to two kilometer shear vector. Let's say we wanted to draw the, say, four to six kilometer wind shear vector. We would, just, we would start at four, draw a vector going toward the six kilometer point there on the hodograph. So you can do it for any level you want. And some of the most common ones um, are zero to six kilometers and zero to eight kilometers. So our zero to eight kilometer vector, I'll do it in a different color here to make it a little bit easier to see. So if we wanted to do our zero to six kilometer wind shear vector, we would start again from zero degrees up toward six. And sometimes these can be a little bit difficult to um, discern their actual uh, magnitude here. But if we, this one's pretty easy. If we transpose it down to the origin, this would be about 80 knots. You can see that 80 knot contour extends right up to about the tip of that vector. So our zero to six kilometer wind shear is about 80 knots. And it's, we would consider this to be southwesterly. So we have a southwesterly wind shear of 80 knots here between zero and six kilometers. And if we check that with our um, numbers here that are plotted on the SPC soundings here in this box, 
you'll notice our 0 to 6 kilometer wind shear, which is right here, about 80 knots out of the southwest, 222 degrees. So we've got that pretty much right on the dot here. And again, can be estimated directly from the hode graph itself. So the next quantity we'll talk about is the storm relative wind vector. And the storm relative wind vector is basically you take the, you, we're subtracting the storm motion out. So it's basically what the storm feels as it exists in, in the environment. And we do that using an assumed storm motion called the bunkers storm motion. And the bunker storm motion is basically assuming two different storm motions, a left moving supercell and a right moving supercell storm motion. So say we have a supercell here, and I try not to go too deep into the, the deep science of this, but basically a supercell as it's developing um, develops, can split, and you'll have a left moving supercell and a right moving supercell. The left moving supercell um, fa that favors sort of anticyclonic supercell storms or uh, it rotates the opposite direction of what we consider to be normal here in the northern hemisphere, which is counterclockwise. And then you'll have one that moves to the right of the mean flow, which is our bunker's right moving storm motion, which I'll abbreviate here as RM. It's abbreviated here as RM um, and LM for left mover on the hodograph. So that right moving supercell is the one that is more favored for tornado production. The left mover more so a hailer, a uh, hail producer. The right moving supercell more of it has much more of a tornado threat than the left mover does. So we're assuming that a supercell in this environment is going to be a right mover. We're going to use this bunker's right moving right mover storm motion, which is plotted here, right here at this bullseye. So the direction and magnitude are also plotted here. It's going to be at 241 degrees at 51 knots. So that's our um, storm motion. So the, to find the storm relative wind vector at a certain level, we would draw a vector starting at the storm motion, the bunker's right moving storm motion, back to the level that we're interested in. So if we wanted to find the storm relative wind vector at the surface, we would start at the bunker's right moving storm motion, and then we'd simply draw a vector back toward the surface. And that would be our surface storm relative wind. If we wanted to do it, say, at 6 kilometers, we wanted to find the storm relative wind vector at 6 kilometers, we would again start at the right mover and just draw a vector back toward the 6 kilometer point on the hodograph. And the storm relative wind vector is a pretty important piece of when we're quantifying, at least perhaps qualitatively, we're describing the type of a quantity called vorticity in the atmosphere. And vorticity is basically a mathematical quantity and it describes the spin in the atmosphere. So there's a whole bunch of different long equations you can do to derive different types of vorticity. But for now, just think of it as the spin in the atmosphere. So we're, when we talk about vorticity as far as a supercell maybe favored to produce tornadoes versus not favored to produce tornadoes, we talk about two types of vorticity, horizontal vorticity. The called streamwise and crosswise. So streamwise vorticity and crosswise vorticity are very important. When we're looking at tornadic supercells, if we have more streamwise vorticity in a certain layer, they are more favorable, that supercell in that environment is more favorable to produce tornadoes. Now how do we find whether a, um, the vorticity is streamwise or cro crosswise? Well, we're gonna use our storm relative wind vector so let's say we wanted to see, to assess the vorticity here at the surface. So first we draw our storm relative wind vector from the bunker's right moving storm motion back to the surface. Now we um, are going to plot our shear vector, which basically goes along the hodograph. Now if you're familiar with calculus, you'll know of something called the right hand rule. So when we're doing, when we're computing, you know, vector quantities, and we want to find the resultant vector, we place our hand, our open hand, along the direction of our vector here. So in this case, we'll put our fingers along the direction of the shear vector. And then we'll fold our fingers in, like we're making a fist, 
and whichever direction our thumb points is where our um, vector, call our horizontal vorticity vector, is going to be plotted. So it's going, it's always going to be perpendicular to our wind shear vector, aka perpendicular to the hodograph going outward. So it's always going to be facing to the left of the hodograph. So that's our horizontal vorticity vector. And the way we figure out whether vorticity is streamwise or crosswise is if our horizontal vorticity vector, which I'll abbreviate as HVV, is parallel to our storm relative wind vector, I'll abbreviate that as SRW, then we have streamwise vorticity. If our horizontal vorticity vector is perpendicular to the storm relative wind vector at a certain level, we have crosswise vorticity. So again, streamwise vorticity is a, is a lot more favorable it, when a supercell sort of ingests it for that supercell to produce tornadoes as opposed to crosswise vorticity. So let's do an example here. I'm going to um, clear the screen here just to make it a little easier to read. So let's say we wanted to assess our vorticity, let's say at five kilometers. So here's our five kilometer point. So we're going to draw first our storm relative wind vector from the bunker's right moving storm motion to our point at five kilometers there on the hodograph. Our shear vector runs along the hodograph, along the direction of the hodograph, so that's our shear vector. And so our horizontal vorticity vector is going to be perpendicular and to the left of that shear vector. So you'll notice here at five kilometers, our, hors our storm relative wind vector is pretty much perfectly parallel to our horizontal vorticity vector, meaning at five kilometers we have almost purely streamwise vorticity. Now let's say we wanted to do, to do the same exercise at six kilometers. We would go again, do our storm, mo storm relative wind vector to six kilometers. Our shear vector, there is kind of an inflection point here, but the shear vector runs along the hodograph. And so our horizontal vorticity vector is going to be perpendicular and to the left of our shear vector, perpendicular and to the left of the hodograph. And you'll notice here in this case, that our storm relative wind vector at six kilometers and the horizontal vorticity vector are almost perfectly perpendicular to each other, meaning at six kilometers there is ample crosswise, oops, crosswise vorticity. So when you have a lot of streamwise vorticity in the low levels, that supercell that takes advantage of that environment is going to be more apt to produce tornadoes versus a lot of crosswise vortex, vorticity in the low level. So if we're assessing this particular hodograph here, this particular setup, let's do here at zero um, kilometers or the surface. So we draw a storm relative wind vector, shear vector here along the hodograph. Our vorticity vector is perpendicular to that. So this is not perfect, but we do have a pretty decent amount of parallel. The parallelness, if you will, between the storm relative wind vector and the horizontal vorticity vector here at the surface. And it actually increases, the streamwise vorticity actually increases as you go up a little bit between zero and one kilometers. So if you were to do the same thing, say at this point here, that's our storm relative wind vector and our shear vector and our horizontal vorticity vector would be pretty parallel. So we have quite a bit of streamwise vorticity here in the low levels, meaning that any right moving supercell in this environment would have ample streamwise vorticity to ingest, in turn making the um, tornado potential a little bit higher than if we had a lot of crosswise vorticity here in the low levels. So hopefully that makes sense. Again, streamwise vorticity in the low levels, much more favorable for tornado production in supercells that can take advantage of a specific environment as opposed to crosswise vorticity. So hopefully that made sense. And um, so the last quantity we will talk about is called storm relative helicity. And storm relative helicity is a, basically a measure of the spin that the storm is experiencing. Helicity make, is based on the word helix, meaning um, helical motion. So if you imagine a this really poorly drawn helix, it's basically just uh, the degree of helical motion of the air in a certain environment is the helicity. And the storm relative portion comes from 
it's basically what the storm feels. So we're using our storm relative wind vectors here. And a pretty common quantity to look at is 0 to 3 kilometer storm relative velocity, abbreviated as SRH. And that often differentiates between supercells and non-supercell thunderstorms. And we'll get into that in, in a future video. But if we want to look and find and estimate the 0 to 3 kilometer SRH from a hodograph, we would just draw our storm relative wind vectors at 0 degrees, uh, excuse me, at 0 kilometers, or the surface, and 3 kilometers. And the area between the hodograph and these two vectors is our storm relative helicity. So you can't really calculate this manually. It's you know very complicated calculus, lots of integration, pretty nasty stuff. But on the SPC soundings, it is given to you in that box down below. It gives us 0 to 1 kilometer SRH, 0 to 3 kilometer SRH, and effective inflow layer SRH. So you can see here in this case, the 0 to 3 kilometer SRH is 417 meters squared per second squared, which is pretty darn large. Anything greater than about 150 meters squared per second squared is considered adequate for supercell thunderstorms. So the higher, the more SRH you have between 0 and 3 kilometers, the more likely you are to get a supercell. And 0 to 1 kilometer storm relative velocity is often differentiate often differentiates tornadic supercells from non-tornadic supercells. And the higher the 0 to 1 kilometer SRH is, the more likely a supercell in that environment is to produce a tornado. Other factors, you know, equal. And it's in this case, we have quite a bit of 0 to 1 kilometer SRH as well, 361 meters squared per second squared. Now this term effective inflow layer is pretty important because it takes into account the buoyancy of the environment. So, for example, if we had a sounding that had a pretty big inversion, so we have, let's say, our temperature line, and it goes like that, and our dew point line goes like that, you know, something like that, and our parcel trace is, you know, kind of going all the way back to our skew t videos. But we have a pretty big inversion here in this case. But let's say we had this hodograph, which we've already determined is pretty favorable for supercells, potentially tornadic supercells. Well, between this level and this level, where that inversion is, that storm is not going to be able to take advantage of the storm relative helicity that is in the environment, the spin in the environment, because the parcels are not buoyant in this level. They're not able to rise on their own. So the effective inflow layer takes that into account. It's bas you basically send up a bunch of different parcels all the way up, and the layer through which they are buoyant, meaning they are able to rise on their own, otherwise, in other words, there is some convective available potential energy, or CAPE, once it meets that certain threshold and the parcels are buoyant, that is part of the effective inflow layer. So in this case, on the SPC soundings, they're drawn via these blue lines here. So our effective inflow layer goes from the surface up to two kilometers. So anywhere above two kilometers, the parcels are no longer buoyant, meaning they are not able to rise on their own. So effective inflow layer, SRH, is basically the storm relative felicity within the effective inflow layer. And when you have a surface-based effective inflow layer, that means parcels are being drawn into this, the storm from the surface, meaning that the storm is surface-based and, in turn, more, apt, more able to produce tornadoes. Elevated storms are not able to drill through that stable layer often, meaning that they are elevated and the, and the tornado threat is pretty much zero. But in this case, we have our effective inflow layer that is surface-based, and the effective layer SRH is going to be this area between the hodograph and our effective inflow layer vectors here, which is from 0 to 2 kilometers. So that is pretty much it for determining some vectors and quantities from the hodograph. Um, in the next video, we're actually going to discuss, put this in action, and look at different hodographs for different environments. Kind of say, you know, this hodograph means that you'll see potentially these severe weather hazards. The storm might look like this. Um, versus in a different environment, it might look like this with a different hodograph, etc. So um, that's all I have for now. Thanks for watching, and we will see you in the next video.